And at that point, there's only going to be one reason to make the same choice. Him. Now, I'm going to be putting out audios that talk about the spiritual maturation process. I've already done videos on that, which goes through it in detail, but I'm going to cover the same topic from different angles that tie to these audios. And the point about the spiritual maturation process that you can even see in the videos now is that there is basically a 10-stage developmental process that Christians go through to get to this point which is classified as spiritual maturity ideally you get to it at about oh I don't know 20-30 years into the spiritual life because that's when Christ started well he was mature really at 12 but his ministry you know his publicness began at age 30 that was the age when kings announced themselves and all that um, you know, David became king at 30. It was a sort of common thing. The point is that once you're, you've had this intensive Bible study of at least seven hours a week in class, let alone the time you spend outside class trying to learn what you learned in class, after about 20, 30 years of that, you really have a lot of Bible under your belt. And that's when all this stuff starts to hit you. At that point, the tenth stage begins, and my pastor likes to classify it as occupation with Christ. That's a term he kind of borrowed from somewhere else. I, I'm not really sure who thought of it first. Watchman Nee also used the same term, but didn't understand it very well. But it's, it's been around, that term, occupation with Christ. And what it means is true love. When you really love something, you're occupied with it. It's on your mind all the time. Okay? Even you could call certain kinds of, you know, it's, you're sort of obsessive about it. And the difference, of course, between love and the wrong kind of obsession is that you stay rational. Okay, love, true love is never irrational. And it's never emotional either. Emotion comes alongside, it's a body product. Emotion is really not in the soul, it's in the body. It's a reaction to thoughts in the soul. Okay, the only way you stay together at that point when you realize that the zigzag pattern is God's own life and if you want to get close to Him, you got to live that same way. The only way you get through it is to look at Christ. And that's Hebrews 12, what Hebrews 12 is talking about. Okay? That's what Philippians 2, 5 through 10 is talking about. You have to keep looking at him to get through the next minute. This is a horror. It's a slog. You're looking at all these people out there, Christians and non-Christians alike. 99% of the people you see are going to hell. And the 1% who are actually believers in Christ don't have a clue about this being the spiritual life so they're all in spiritual childhood they're going to die retards and for all you know you're going to be king over them if you stay the course okay wanting to stay the course that's a real hard thing to desire at this point it turns out to be the last thing you want first of all at this point you don't even you're not even interested in having power over other people you're interested in, in knowing Christ. That's it. It's your whole life at that point. Everything else is boring. Everything else is second rate. Knowing Him is everything. That's what Paul said. Knowing Christ. Living Christ. Dying prophet. Philippians 1.21 just flew into my mind. Okay, and, and that's just after the verse. That's Philippians 1.20 where he uses the Greek word megaluno. And it's unfortunately translated magnify Christ that's not what it means it means to ma it means to um, exalt or to praise by means of multiplication it's the same verb that Mary used in the Magnificat and of course she's using it because you know she's pregnant it's very funny and Paul's playing on Mary again 
who played on Mary in Ephesians 1 through 14 by aping her meter style, and now he's playing on her Magnificat yet again um, by using the word megaluno. And of course, Paul's the whole, any scholar will tell you this, Paul is totally preoccupied with the whole pregnancy metaphor, which is Isaiah 53 10. That's Paul's hub. Paul and John both, they are constantly hubbing off Isaiah 53.10 and all their writings. Okay? It's really hysterical. And so Paul's t- constantly talking about pregnancy. You can't see it in English because the prudish translators bland it out. Alright? But the, the, the people who are Greek students and teachers, they know this. It's one of the famous facts about Paul that all the scholars know. That he's hung up on coarse language and he's hung up on pregnancy which he never stops talking about. It's in all of his letters. So that's what he's talking about, of course, in Philippians. Philippians 1.20, my soul, okay, that playing on Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord. That's Megaluno, okay. And so he's saying the same thing, that, that people, that's why he talks about imitate him. He's talking about begetting. The whole book of Ephesians is based on beginning. The whole book of Ephesians is a play off Euripides' Ion, which was about the beginning of the Greek sea peoples. His whole, the whole book of Ephesians is patterned after that play by Euripides. He's charting his chapters based on the play, which the Greek audience that read it would have gotten that right away and been laughing. Because Paul's telling the story in Ephesians about the real begetter, and what he's begetting is not venom. Ion, which is the title of the play, means venom, spawn of the snake. It's a euphemism for semen. Okay, so Paul's being very coarse. He's totally hung up on the pregnancy thing, on seeding. Because that's what Isaiah 53.10 is all about, making kids. Not making good deeds, making kids. What you become, not what you do. Christ became the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so now the idea is to have all these kids with Christ thinking in them. That's how the beginning works. Okay, so Paul is saying, living Christ, dying prophet. It's very funny. Because he just finished talking about Megaluno, which is to magnify the the parent by multiplying, by having kids. See, the, uh, in the ancient world, the more kids you had, the more um, rich you were, the, the more you were um, glorified. That was the standard in the ancient world. The more kids you had, the more you were glorified as a person. So Paul's playing off that Greek cultural idiom. So the point is, is that you have to get to where Paul's thinking is which is where Christ's thinking was, in order to get through this. And you can only get through it by thinking like Paul did, living Christ, dying prophet. Because the actual life you live on a moment-by-moment basis, at this point, becomes like God's own. It's not the same scope, and obviously you're failing all the time, but the style is the same. Slock. The high and the low, my pastor calls it merge. The the whole goal is to have the high and the low merge and unite at every dot in time. When God baptized everything, at you know when He decreed creation, He did it with a baptized meaning that He wanted on every single speck of dust because He's going to see it forever. So every thought that you have. He's got a baptized meaning for that thought to make it worth his time to watch it. And the cross bought that. So we're all like dividends of the cross. And that's why we can be a worthy reward to Christ. God's going to, has this baptized meaning on all of us. That he's made out of us. Okay, and the question is simply, are you going to receive it or not? Just like the gospel. Gospel, Christ paid for everybody who's ever been born, never will be. Because God has to see that person live. Okay? But, if the person doesn't want to benefit from that, 
Then he says, no, I don't believe. And he keeps saying that same no throughout his lifetime. And he goes to hell. Okay, but God didn't get cheated. God got paid. The person refused to receive the benefit from the payment, which God also willed. But hey, you don't want the benefit from the payment that God received? Fine. See, in other words, Christ paid God, and God says, God decreed an eternity past, I want to spend it on this, 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 and this. Okay, and if the person who I'm doing all this to, or doing all, making all this out of, wants to get the blessing, then all I have to do is say yes. If he doesn't say yes, well, okay. You see, God got paid unconditionally. It's his work, it's his sovereign will to spend it where he wants. He wants to spend it on you and me. But he's not going to do it if we don't want it. So, that's the deal. The catch is that it's full spectrum. The good news is he's got all this gorgeousness of meaning that he sees, that he wants you to see also, me to see also. Okay, but we're not going to see it this side of heaven. We're going to see glimpses. We're going to see doctrinal meanings. And they don't feel good. And the, the farther you go in the spiritual life, the more he unites the low to the high, just like he did at the cross. My pastor calls that the merge and being on the high ground. That's called spiritual maturity in the Bible. And of course, my pastor uses that term also. And the, the actual thought pattern that's like the title of this phase is occupation with Christ. Because that's the only way you can get through it. You have to keep looking at Christ, like Paul says, living Christ, dying prophet. It's the only way you can get through it. Because the lifestyle that you live on the ground is slog. And it, it's not better if your life is nice. And it's certainly, of course, you know, obviously not better when your life is not nice. It's just slog, slog, kata, skopon, dioko, Philippians 3.14. I keep on pressing to the high calling of God, to the prize. The prize is to get that unity happening in your life, in your thinking, where you just keep going. And the th like Paul says, you're failing all the time in Romans 7. Paul was constantly failing, using one John 1 9, getting up again. The spiritual life and maturation and victory is not measured by how often you fall down. It's measured by the fact that you get up and keep going. That's what Philippians 3.14 is saying. I keep on pressing to the goal. He doesn't say he doesn't fall down. In battle, you always fall down. In battle, everything you do, you could have done better or you think you could have done better. It's a melee. I don't know if you've watched battles on television, but they've gotten to be pretty realistic. It's a horror. That's how your life is, like being on a battlefield 24-7. You're always fighting something. You know, it's like hurry up and wait. The life of a soldier is hurry up and wait, and then, you know... 20, 30 minutes or 2 hours or 2 days or 10 days of sheer terror will your, will your weapon fire will you be in the right place at the right time is there a bullet with your name on it you know, you've got all these things going on and then you're sweating and then your weapon's not necessarily clean and you're not sure it's going to fire properly you know a, a thousand things that are menial that have to be attended to in the middle of battle it's very frustrating and it's fearful but it's more frustrating than fearful how do you get how do you get on and it's not like it's short it today tomorrow the next day until you die so at this phase in your life all the highs and the lows are going to join together and the weird thing that happens is that when you get the high stuff, it was something that you really wanted when you were younger, spiritually, but it doesn't impress you anymore. And the stuff that's really gruesome, that you don't like, that you have to live with every day, 
you find that, and it doesn't even make sense, that it's actually preferable. It, it, like I said, this is a weird book. It's a weird God. It's a weird gospel. It's a weird spiritual life. It's 100% the opposite of everything we expect it to be. God l deliberately, because he wants to, lowers himself to join with everything. That's how he wants to live. He can snap his fingers and everything would be perfect. There'd never be a problem. Well, he just doesn't like that. Truth isn't free if that's the way he does it. That's the first thing he doesn't like about it. Truth be free is what he wants. Well, the only way truth can be free is that he has to make good on it too. So now he's paying double. First he's paying in the sense of having to live with everything be free and low and insufferably lower than him. On top of that, he has to make good on it. So he's paying a second cost. Thirdly, there's a third cost, which is really the first. Christ pays for sins, because that's the basis for the whole badness. Okay, but why should Christ have to pay for sins? And what's really happening on the cross? He's being stabbed, and that's it. He's thinking something in reply. That's it. That's all that happens. The sins don't change. They're in God's mind forever. The first sin that was ever sin is still ongoing because that moment is forever alive to God. Well, how does that compensate? See, this is a weird story. That's why Christians don't get it. They, how do you want to call it? They anthropomorphize God. They anthropopathize God. And ascribe to God human ideas and human motives and human this and human that so that the real story is completely covered up. Okay, fine. If you survive childhood and you get to this place where you see what the real story is, how do you want to live? How can you survive wanting this is your future? Because it is your future. It's your future. The day you get here, it's God and this slog of the constant battle and the only respite you get is at, is at night. And honey, it doesn't matter how nice your life is. Because it's not nice for other people. So if your life is nice, that hurts. Because everybody else doesn't have the same life you do. See, you're thinking like God. God lowers himself because he wants us to have a better life without violating our volition. Well, that's what you want to at this phase. And you can't stand having nice stuff because Joe Blow in Africa doesn't have it. So you can't enjoy the th stuff you thought you would enjoy because somebody else is missing what you got. Okay, but you can't give it away. You can't give Bible away. I've been trying. It doesn't work. You can't, give, you can't throw money at the poor and have it solve their problems. They need education. And they don't want education. People don't like to learn. It's too hard. It's too much of a battle. Learning Bible, nobody likes. They like to pretend that they know it. They like to pretend that they're smart in it. But really understanding all this, nobody does. The only thing that even gets you to this place is that you're interested enough to know God. And by the way, even though he's got everything and he's totally rich, this is what he chooses to do with his life. And you know what? If you love him, you got to do the same thing. See, it stops being about him being superior and you being inferior. That merges into high. This is how I choose to live my life. You want to live it my way? And obviously he's the only one who can enable you to do that. And if you say yes, oh, I'm sorry, it's a constant battle. See, I told you, weird book, weird gospel, weird lifestyle, 100% the opposite of what we expect or what we will want this life to be.